Hi everybody, this is Kate Mulvaney. Welcome to the next instalment of Sydney Theatre Company Virtual. I hope you're all going okay out there and staying safe and healthy. Uh, I'm going to read today from The Harp in the South by Ruth Park, the novel. Uh, I adapted this for the Sydney Theatre Company a couple of years ago and uh, during that production I got home one night and I found this little treasure sitting on my front doorstep. It's a 1948 original version of the book and it was left by a neighbour who is related to Ruth. It uh, came with the bookmark as well, the original bookmark, which says mark the page and remember the place. Uh, so let's get into it. While I'm reading, some images from the play will be projected behind me. The inscription that Ruth has put in this book I love. It says, to my father who first told me stories and my mother who first encouraged me to write them. I can relate to that. Chapter one. The Harp in the South by Ruth Park. The hills are full of Irish people. When their grandfathers and great-grandfathers arrived in Sydney, they went naturally to Shantytown, not because they were dirty or lazy, although many of them were that, but because they were poor. And wherever there are poor, you will find landlords who build tenements, cramming two on a piece of land no bigger than a pocket handkerchief and letting them for the rent of four. In the squalid, mazy streets of sandstone double-decker houses, each with its little balcony edged with rusty iron lace and its door opening onto the street, or four-foot square of front, every second name is an Irish one. There are Brodies and Caseys and Murphys and O'Briens, and down by the corner are Casement and Grogan and Kell. And although here and there you find a Simich or a Siciliano or a Jewish shopkeeper or a Chinese laundryman, most are Irish. Even the names of the streets tell the story of those old emigrants who came looking for roads cobbled with gold and found them made of stone harder than an overseer's heart. There is Fay Street running off Riley Street and both of them branching from Coronation Street, which had the name of Kelleher before they changed it to one of Queen Victoria. And there is Ryan Street running down into Redfern and Brophy Street, mean and horrible, flowing into Elizabeth Street, which leads to the city. This was the place where the Darcys lived, Plymouth Street, Surrey Hills, Sydney, in an unlucky house which the landlord had renumbered from 13 to 12 and a half. It was the oldest in Plymouth Street, a cranky brown house with a blistered green door and a step worn into dimples and hollows that collected the rain in little pools in which Rowie and Dollar, when little, had always expected to find frogs. There were many houses like number 12 and a half, smelling of leaking gas and rats and mouldering wallpaper which had soaked up the odours of a thousand meals. The stairs were very dark and steep and built on a slant as though the architect were drunk so that from the top landing you couldn't actually see the bottom. On the top landing hung a little globe, very high up so that the tenants couldn't steal it. It was as small as a star and as yellow as a lemon. Downstairs there was a dark bedroom without window or skylight, a kitchen with a broken floor and a scullery with one window overlooking the little flagged yard where a drunken garbage can stood with its lid over one ear. Upstairs were three cramped attic bedrooms. Huey and Mama had slept in one of these for a long time but it had a sloping roof so that anybody bouncing hastily out of the left-hand side of the bed hit himself a terrible blow on top of the head and fell prostrate again. Huey had done this a thousand times, both drunk and sober, and it was the main cause of his frequent absence from work, as he pointed out to Mama. By the time he'd shaken his brains back into their proper place, it was past the hour and no use going to work at all, seeing that a man was fine for every minute he was late. He had promised himself time and time again that he'd move the bed, but somehow it never got done, for it meant rearranging all the furniture and that would take a full afternoon of time. He could not afford that. For Saturday afternoon, he always spent at the pub, and Sunday afternoon, he spent sleeping off Saturday afternoon. So the simplest thing was to move the children into the attic while he and Mama took the dark bedroom downstairs. Once, Rowie and Dollar had had a little brother, Thady. When he was six and Rowie nine and Dollar two, he had been sent out onto the footpath to play, for the backyard was too small and dirty and sunless and he had just disappeared. Nothing was ever heard of him again. No one had seen a man or woman leading him off or a car carry him away. 
There was just a little box cart left lying on the roadway, and that was all. Huey had rampaged around the streets and through the alleyways like a madman. He had accompanied the police as they patrolled the sewers. Grim-lipped and devil-faced, he had sworn that God and he would never be friends while the agony and mystery of Thady's disappearance hung over them. But Mama had never given up hope. She often stood at the gates of boys' schools looking and looking, adding the slow years to Thady's stature and maturity to his little round face. It was ten years since he had disappeared. Dola did not remember him at all, and Rowie only a little. But he was a living presence in that house. He was like a ghost who is not dead. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Sydney Theatre Company virtual instalment by me. Thanks, Ruth Park. Um, obviously, it's a very difficult time for artists and companies in Australia. Uh, if you have any spare uh, time change at all, please contribute to the Sydney Theatre Company or to any theatre company in Australia or to the Actors Benevolent Fund and all of the details will be in the text. Thank you so much. Stay safe and take care.